and thank you for joining us for our first virtual Tulane Alumni Travel Faculty Lecture Series. I'm Laurie Hurwitz, Tulane's new Associate Vice President for Alumni Relations. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone to please mute your audio. We will have time for questions at the end of Professor Brumfield's lecture, so please submit them through the chat function at any time during his talk. And finally, stay tuned until the end when we announce five winners of Professor Brumfield's latest book, Journey Through the Russian Empire, and you do need to be present to win. It is my honor to introduce Professor William Kraft Brumfield, who will take us into a journey through the Russian Empire this evening. In this lecture, Professor Brumfield will share experiences from his many decades of travel and photography in Russia. The presentation will include views of Russia's remarkable wooden architecture. Professor William Kraft Brumfield is a professor of Slavic studies and the Seisler Professor of Jewish Studies at Tulane and a recipient of the 2000 John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship, as well as a fellow at the National Humanities Center. In December 2019, Professor Brumfield's nearly 50 years of work and dedication to the betterment of relations with the Russian Federation and its people was recognized during a ceremony at the Russian Embassy in Washington, DC, where he was presented with the Order of Friendship Medal, the highest state decoration of the Russian Federation given to foreign nationals. Bill is a Tulane alumnus, arts and sciences class of 1966. And after graduation, he went on to earn his PhD in 1973 in Slavic languages, specializing in 19th century Russian literature and history at the University of California, Berkeley. He served as an assistant professor at Harvard University from 1974 to 1980 and held visiting professorships at the University of, Universities of Wisconsin and Virginia. He returned to Tulane in 1980 and in 1997 received the annual Faculty Research Award from the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Tulane. Professor Brumfield is the author and photographer of several works on Russian architecture, among them, The Origins of Modernism in Russian Architecture, A History of Russian Architecture, which the New York Times Book Review included in its Notable Books of the Year in 1993, and his latest book, Journey Through the Russian Empire, published by the Duke Press and available now on Amazon. He has numerous other publications on Russian architecture, photography, and literature, and has frequently lectured on these topics at museums and universities in North America and Europe. His photographs of Russian architecture have been exhibited at numerous galleries and museums and are part of the Department of Image Collections collection at the National Gallery, Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Please join me in welcoming Bill Brumfield. Hello, it's so good to be here. Uh, I hope you can all hear me and see me. Um, I'm particularly pleased, uh, not only on the occasion of this first in a series of alumni broadcast, uh, a virtual tour, uh, but also because it is, if memory serves, uh, the 35th anniversary of uh, my first trip with Tulane alumni in Russia. It was the beginning of the Gorbachev era and uh, Russia was opening up the uh, possibilities seem limitless. And we went on I, perhaps the first cruise arranged for a Westerners down the Volga River. So this is really a time for memories and it's so good to reconnect with Tulane alumni and Tulane alumni travel. Um, and finally, uh, we are here on the occasion of a magnificent new book, Journeys Through the Russian Empire a book that is really a miracle of the art of bookmaking. Uh, Duke University Press, under the most difficult of circumstances, managed to uh, bring this extraordinary volume, 520 pages, that weighs over six pounds. Um, they bring it out and uh, really we can share the work that I've done over the past five decades, work that I've shared with Tulane students, alumni and faculty colleagues, and it is such a pleasure to be able to offer that book uh, and talk about that book to you today. Um, so if we begin the, um, the slide presentation, uh, I'll be showing you uh, some things that you'll see if you take that cruise, as alumni groups often do, between Moscow and St. Petersburg, along a river and canal network between Russia's two uh, capitals, two major cities, Moscow and St. Petersburg. But along the way, uh, you'll see a, um, a fascinating part of Russian culture, and particularly the island of Kiji, 
uh, in Lake Onega. Uh, it's toward the uh, Finnish border in the north, extreme northwestern part of the country. And one of the greatest uh, examples of wooden architecture, that distinctive form of Russian construction, log churches, dates back uh, perhaps as early as some of them. Uh, we know from chronicles as early as the 10th century, Russians were building in logs. They lived in a forest zone. And none is more impressive than the Church of the Transfiguration uh, on the Kiji Island, uh, built in the early 18th century, uh, 1714, if memory serves, uh, purportedly to serve as a, um, a triumph uh, a memory of Peter the Great's victory over the Swedes in the Battle of Poltava in 1709. At least that's the version. Uh, the, the building itself is on the UNESCO list of World Heritage Monuments, has 24 domes, yes, 24 wooden domes. And uh, in this photograph, all of the photographs of mine, we can go back to that previous photograph just a little bit longer. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, you can see that it's pine, stout pine logs. Now this photograph was taken in 1993 on a two-lane alumni cruise, I might add. Um, and you can see these vertical beams uh, because the church was in danger of collapsing. Um, uh, in the olden times, they were designed so that uh, logs that had uh, shown rot could be replaced. But if that's not done on a regular basis, these enormous structures weighing hundreds of tons will eventually begin to decline uh, and uh, the danger of collapse is imminent. Um, uh, so this monument was finally, with the help of a Swedish firm, um, encased with a scaffolding and literally elevated so that the, uh, uh, the um, logs with defects could be removed and the whole structure could be uh, again, placed on a firm foundation. Uh, it's an extraordinarily difficult technical feat. Now, if you go there, you will see it as I photographed it without the vertical support beams uh, that you see on either side of this photograph taken in uh, July, at the end of July, 1993. Uh, one of the great monuments of Russian culture one of the most distinctive monuments of world architecture. Here we see it in an east view. So we can go on to the next slides. Uh, this is the ch a church that's uh, next to it, the Church of the Intercession, built about 50 years later. Uh, it's smaller in form and it was used for worship in the winter because it could be more easily heated. Uh, and it too has a panoply of domes at the top I should say the basic structure is pine, and pine ages dark, but the shingles uh, at the top of these cupolas at these two churches um, are of aspen. Aspen originally golden color when it's freshly cut, but it ages to silver. So we have this remarkable contrast between uh, the deep uh, color of the basic structure and the uh, crown of cupolas at the top uh, with their a radiant uh, sheen. If we can go to the next slide. Yes, and here you see the um, ensemble together. Uh, this uh, a photograph was taken in 2007 on yet another Tulane alumni cruise. Uh, we, here we got there in the morning. This is morning light. Depending on the schedule, sometimes you'll get there the afternoon, sometimes in the morning. Um, uh, the uh, uh, cruise ships to keep to a very precise schedule. And uh, we have a, a, a couple of hours out on this UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's just stunning to as the ship approaches this island um, where you have one of the great monuments of Russian culture. So here you have the Church of the Transfiguration on the right, uh, the uh, Church of the uh, Intercession on the, uh, on the left, uh, and the bell tower uh, built in the 19th century. And it's on a sacred territory that was used as a burial site for time immemorial. Islands were considered sacred spaces, not only in Russian culture. Oh, we can go to the next. And there is a black and white photograph. 
Originally, when the National Gallery began collecting my work in 1985, black and white photography was the only archival medium. So that I always carried two cameras, at least two cameras, one with color film and one with black and white. I love black and white as an artistic medium. Uh, this photograph was taken in uh, uh, August of 1991, just a week before uh, the putsch attempt against Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, an attempt that failed, as you remember, and ultimately led later that year to the dissolution of the Soviet Union, a peaceful dissolution uh, that the Russians and other peoples of the Soviet Union arranged um, to deal with that uh, crisis at the end of the communist era. So here we see this extraordinary uh, a monument, the Church of the Transfiguration with its 24 domes, you see about 16 of them in this photograph, uh, rising above the stone wall enclosing the sacred precinct. The black and white is really uh, in some ways my favorite uh, aesthetic uh, media in my work as a photographer. Now the National Gallery collects all of my work, color and black and white. We've entered the digital era uh, so how times have changed, but that black and white uh, work is a very important part of what I do. This is Church of the uh, Miraculous Icon of the Savior. Uh, it's dated tentatively to the uh, 16th century, although there's some question about that. And you can see even the small churches show this, uh, this remarkable sense of a mixture of uh, functionality and aesthetic. Look at that double slanted roof, for example. Uh, it uh, is extraordinarily beautiful to look at, and at the same time, it served a function to, function to shed melting snow and precipitation, uh, which there is a great deal in this era, uh, uh, area, showing, uh, uh, enabling it to get away from the log, so that the log structure is itself protected from excessive moisture. So the moisture runs off the first roof and then the second roof uh, throws it still uh, farther from the uh, structure itself. And you have a little bell tower over on the west side. Next slide, please. And the interior of uh, the earlier church that we were talking about, um, uh, the uh, intercession, here you see an icon screen. Uh, Russian churches, whether wooden or of stone and brick, uh, and their east side before the altar will always have a screen for displaying icons or religious images, which play such an important part in Russian culture. Uh, and uh, one can go through the strict order. We won't do this in this presentation, but this is an example of what you see. As I explain to my students, uh, I'm not Russian Orthodox, there's no religious agenda here, but we're entering a cultural space and it helps to be literate within that space, to know how the symbols of their culture, of their faith uh, are realized uh, in artistic form. I might say in my book, I also have a section on Central Asia with mosques and I have a separate site in this country devoted to my photograph of uh, monuments of Jewish culture uh, and uh, spirituality. Uh, Russia is a multi-confessional, multicultural country, um, but still these monuments of traditional Russian Orthodox spirituality are a very important component of what one would see uh, on a trip to Russia. The next slide, please. We can go beyond. Yes, another example, and we can advance rather rapidly now, just examples of these wooden uh, monuments, I would call them masterpieces of world architecture. And I've taken, this photograph was one of my first, 1988, as is this, that my first foray into the Russian North, which was a closed territory uh, until the Gorbachev era. Here, 1988, August 1988, and that brooding overcast sky. Other examples of the black and white work, all of this in the collection of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, part of the images collection. If you want to see more examples of that, you can go to the National Gallery site and at the search bar above, simply type in my name, William Brumfield, 
and you will find links to five special features that the National Gallery has done based on my collection. The next slide, please. This is perhaps the oldest known wooden building in Russia, dated back to the late 14th century, Church of the Resurrection of Lazarus from the village of Morum. Uh, perhaps because it was so small, it is more easily endured, there's less stress, less weight on the walls. Um, much has been replaced, particularly all of the roof work, uh, but the original logs have been dated to the late 14th century. Next slide, yes. Other examples, these are buildings that have been brought to the island of Tiji from the surrounding territory. It is an open air museum. The two great churches were there on their original site, but other places on the island have served as a uh, territory in which they can be carefully preserved, monitored, and people can visit them uh, within an accessible distance. Next. Yes, again, we return to the Church of the Transfiguration. One view after another in the shadow of the bell tower over on the left, one of my favorite photographs of this building. Again, taken in that magical summer of August 1991. A bell tower with a church attached, typical of the Russian North. There's a sense of the vertical, we really lived in a forested zone with great distances between communities. These log churches and towers, and tower churches, uh, could serve as a signal of the community within this landscape. All, everything that you're seeing now would be included in one of the river cruise tours during the time that you would have on the island of Kiji. Perhaps you'd want to spend more time in the south part where the two large churches are, but these other uh, displays are there available and accessible. Next slide, please. We just views we can advance now rapidly as we go through this uh, essay, photographic essay of one of the marvels of traditional Russian culture, uh, to this day considered some of the major contributions of uh, uh, Russian uh, architecture uh, to uh, the uh, imagination of the entire world. There you can see from the lake, you can see a vision seemingly rising up out of the water. The Church of the Transfiguration over on the left, the Intercession Church to the right, and the bell tower. Uh, this uh, was taken in 1993. All of these photographs were taken on alumni cruises. Perhaps the most magical of the photographs that I've taken was taken from the ship uh, in August of 1991, before uh, a week before the putsch attempt in Russia. And this is the setting sun, the way it's reflected off of the timber, off of those shingles after a rainstorm. Is that sheen? People look at this and say, is this wood? Uh, yes, it is. And that, northern setting, rich sunlight uh, in the evening, such a distinctive part uh, of the Russian landscape, cultural landscape, natural landscape. Uh, I can think of no better example of the miracle and the mystery of Russian culture. I can say that the transfiguration in the Russian church calendar occurs in August, so I took it very close to the day on which the Transfiguration Feast is celebrated, and it has to do with a miracle of light, of uh, the form of Jesus transfigured by light from heaven. Well, uh, this photograph itself represents a miracle of light. So West View and the setting sun, yet another close up from that same sequence. I'm standing on the boat deck. Fortunately, I have 200 speed Kodachrome. The deck is, uh, uh, has vibrations from the engines. Uh, it was minimal light, a telephoto lens, uh, but um, I was able to get just the right combination on that rich Kodachrome film um, in a very difficult situation. So, 
um, uh, these have an ex a very deep resonance for me because they intersect with Russian history. This is a momentous time in Russia's attempt to reconfigure uh, its political system. All of these photographs were taken in this recent series, including this black and white photograph, in August of 1991, one week before the putsch attempt to overthrow Mikhail Gorbachev. Next slide. Now this was taken uh, two years later in 1993. The same buildings, and yet the impression, although powerful, uh, is quite different because the um, confluence of light, moisture, uh, and time of day was just a little bit different. And if you could compare what you've just seen with this photograph, uh, you notice again what uh, the miraculous effect that light can produce, particularly in these northern regions. We're a, a couple of hundred miles, a mile south of the Arctic Circle here, uh, so that in the late summer, the light is particularly uh, rich. In this case, it's, we'll call it a rather uh, neutral light showing the, uh, the various shades of gray of the structure, uh, but uh, not having quite that magic of the 1991 sequence taken after a thunderstorm when the wood was saturated with moisture. This is one of the reasons you get the golden glow in those earlier photographs. But I love these as well. Uh, this is uh, just simply another variant. Uh, again, 1991 series, the power of black and white, dynamic photograph, very graphic in its style. And you can see the vertical beams nailed up against the sides to prevent this monument of world culture on the UNESCO list from collapsing. Now those beams are no longer there after a very complicated uh, restoration of the entire structure. Next, please. Details. There you see some of the 30,000 aspen shingles on the cupolas of the Transfiguration churches. And you can see the, the gulls, particularly like those perches on the cross. Uh, the shingles were all replaced after the Second World War. Uh, being made of aspen, they tend to decay more rapidly. In the 19th century, in fact, uh, the cupolas were sheathed in uh, metal. Uh, but uh, rest restorers after the Second World War decided to uh, restore this to its original glory of craftsmanship and so now you see um, a few of the 30,000 aspen shingles that cover the 24 cupolas of the Church of the Transfiguration at Kiji. Another telephoto shot of that uh, display of domes, both of the churches now here in the lens. 24 photographs of, uh, excuse me, cupolas on the left uh, and nine cupolas of the uh, church on the right, both a part of the original Kiji ensemble. And all of this you will see either morning or afternoon uh, during a, uh, a cruise along uh, the river network that connects Moscow and St. Petersburg. That network, by the way, was established, uh, first created by Peter the Great at the beginning of the 18th century. After all, he founded St. Petersburg um, and, um, in 1703 and intended that it would be his window to the west uh, so that the system along which the cruise boat goes uh, is a part of Russian history itself. Here you see another view uh, of the uh, intercession church with its nine aspen cupolas at the top. And uh, next, please. Then we can go on to the next. Each part here is a wonderful expression of functionality as well uh, as an aesthetic and spiritual sense. Another view of an icon screen at the Intercession Church at TG. Next slide, please. Some of the details of the houses, uh, because they're not only a church is there. Well, this in fact is the Mandelian church, but their houses would have the same decoration. You can see how the carved elements uh, dropping down from the roof beam 
cast a, a shadow uh, that is itself a work of art. Magic again plays a part of the symbolism. Look at the solar symbol toward the bottom of that carved element so that you have a mixture of the symbol of the cross uh, and the ancient folk traditions of the solar symbol, particularly important in the Russian north where sun was valued uh, at least part because of its rarity. But we've been lucky on these cruises in the summer. You'll usually have sun. Next slide. And more views, we can switch uh, uh, more rapidly now, I think, to the slides. Just get the uh, view, the, the magic again of the light, the way it transforms these log structures. Now I want to go to another series that you will also see uh, on the river cruise. After the Second World War, uh, the Soviet Union embarked on a massive program of um, hydroelectric dam construction along its major rivers. Uh, this project actually began in the 1930s before the war. Uh, but um, uh, now we uh, see the results raised the water level of rivers. They became reservoirs. Rivers became reservoirs. And here you see the drowned church uh, at Krochino. And again, uh, as I saw it on an alumni cruise in 2006, we go to the next photograph. Uh, well, actually now we're, we're going to a place even farther north to the um, Transfiguration Monastery. Again, Transfiguration at Miracle of Light. Uh, this Transfiguration Monastery of Solovetsky Island, uh, written about uh, by Solzhenitsyn as a part of the original gulag system, that infamous system, which in a sense really began here in this monastery. Many monasteries were turned into prisons during the Soviet period. Why? Because they had walls. People could be in prison within them. So that sad fate occurred in these sacred sites. Here you see again the setting sun. This photograph was taken at midnight, midnight at the end of June, close to the summer solstice. So that we see the North is not only about wooden architecture, but also about uh, magnificent structures and stone and brick uh, created an enormous effort. These are other views of the Transfiguration Monastery on Solovetsky Island as it has been restored uh, in the 1990s. And this was one of the most infamous prisons, uh, uh, prison camps uh, in the Soviet Union before it was closed in 1939 because Stalin had created a much larger system of concentration gulag camps throughout the Soviet Union. But the system had its sad beginnings here and yet the architecture reminds us there are values that transcend even the most terrible episodes in the history of humanity. This used as a place of despair and oppression um, uh, during the Soviet period, particularly the early Soviet period, the 1920s and 1930s, about which Solzhenitsyn wrote so vividly in his book, Archipelago Gulag. This once again has become a place of repose, of quiet, and of spiritual, cultural beauty. Next slide, please. Other views, and we can uh, advance more rapidly now of the uh, Transfiguration Monastery. In my book, Journeys Through the Russian Empire, I uh, compare my photographs taken at the end of the 1990s in Solovetsky Island uh, with the photographs of Sergei Prokudin Gorsky, uh, Gorsky uh, who at the beginning of the 20th century perfected a method for color photography. It was a very complicated method, and ultimately it had no per commercial application but he managed to take uh, over 2,000 glass images, uh, which in effect were color separations. They could be combined, basic colors with the three exposures could be combined to a color image. What you are seeing here is a color photograph. It is not a colorized photograph. It is an actual three 
segment color photograph combined by the Library of Congress. Why the Library of Congress? Because in another miracle that seems to uh, hover over works of art, uh, his descendants, who uh, lived near Paris in 1948, sold the collection uh, to a representative of the Library of Congress. And since then, it has been there. The Library of Congress at, in 2000 scanned the entire collection. It is now available and it forms the basis of my a book, Journeys Through the Russian Empire. Now we're going back to Prokutin Gorsky. Yes, that same Prokutin Gorsky, his photograph of the drowned church. Uh, you saw my photograph there. Yes, there it is. Now this was taken in 1993 uh, on one of the Tulane alumni cruises. And you can see the church is still pretty much intact. It was used as a light uh, beacon for navigation. And if we go to the next photograph, uh, here 2000, well, we seem to be segue between uh, the uh, uh, Transfiguration Monastery and the Drowned Church, but that's all good. I should say that the uh, Transfiguration Monastery is available for tourist trips, but it is not a part of the river cruises. It's in the White Sea and is a very different itiner itinerary, uh, but it is available and open um, on a carefully timed basis for inspection. But through my work and my photographs, you can see it uh, in comparison with the work of Prokutin Gorsky in the early 20th century. And that forms the basis of my book, Journeys Through the Russian Empire. Precisely this careful scholarly comparison between photographs at the beginning of the 20th century and mine at the turn of the 21st century. So if we can go on to another view, and uh, there is the Solovetsky Monastery. What an extraordinary day that was. The light is so rich, uh, bringing out all of the shapes, this array of domes, churches dating from the 16th century to the early 19th century. Uh, this, again, return, it too, is a part, if I'm not mistaken, of the UNESCO World Heritage List. Next slide. Now we're back to our drowned church. So we have a, a leapfrog here um, uh, motion and uh, keep you uh, actively engaged here. You can see this 1993 photograph uh, with the church well, somewhat intact. Now let's see what we have next. Next slide. No, we're back to the Solovetsky Monastery, all right? With the great cathedral of the Transfiguration in stone. We had a, a wooden church dedicated to the Transfiguration at the beginning. Now we are seeing uh, a, ma a masonry structure built in the middle of the 16th century. Yes, 16th century during the reign of Ivan the Terrible. Next slide. Now, here we get back to the uh, our church, in my photograph of 2006, the uh, cruise boats will go very close to this church. And you can see much of it has collapsed since my earlier photographs in 93. That's why the National Gallery collects my photographs. They're precisely dated. They're not only works of art, they're also documents. Uh, they have the date which they were taken so that people can study changes. Um, uh, in some cases, uh, the process of destruction of monuments of Russian culture and architecture. Next slide, please. And again, back to the Transfiguration Cathedral at Solovetsky Island. What an extraordinary, built during the reign of Ivan the Terrible in the middle of the 16th century. One of the most distinctive monuments of Russian architecture. A church that also was a fortress. Speaking of fortress walls, the boulders, the granite boulders that comprise the walls of Solovetsky Transfiguration Monastery. We go to the next. Here we're back to the, uh, the church in my photograph of 2006, the drowned church, the Prokutigorsky photograph at the beginning of the 20th century, and an IF photograph in its successive uh, stages of collapse. However, I must say, uh, this story has somewhat of a happy ending because Russian preservationists have actually built a small dam around this church. 
uh, so that its um, uh, ruins, if uh, they can never be restored, then at least they can be preserved as a monument to what preceding generations built. So that this ruin does have a chance, and the bell tower over to the left, uh, they both have a chance of surviving, thanks to the dedicated volunteer effort of Russian preservationists. They've actually built a little dam around the structure um, since this photograph was taken. Next photograph. And a detail of the monumental walls of the Solovetsky Monastery. Move ahead, the granite boulders that were all moved into place, great effort, dug out of the ground around that. Those fortress walls literally arose out of the ground surrounding this monastery. The churches on the inside are a brick. There were brick kilns made here, but the walls are of rough natural stone taken from the marshes and swamps uh, around the area uh, of this monastery located uh, in the southwestern part of the White Sea. Another view, the monastery pond or harbor in the foreground, the magical reflection in the water itself. It seems to get to rise out of the waters uh, in, in the matter of a Russian a fairy tale. And we can go to the final concluding slides before we get to your collection, uh, questions. It's a Perkutin Gorsky's photograph uh, of that, uh, the drowned church at Krokina. And I had photographed that same church. Here, we'll get to the next slide. And this is an aerial view of the Transfiguration Monastery. The little plane that I was in was bumping in the air currents there. Uh, but um, fortunately, again, I had a fast speed of film and was able to get this uh, example of the entire ensemble set within the um, forests and marshes of the Solovetsky Archipelago of the Russian North. One of my favorite photographs. And here we conclude with yet another view of the drowned church at Krokina. Perkutin Gorsky photographed it when it was still above the waters, when there was still a river here rather than a reservoir. I've been able to record it uh, at over a period of decades uh, as it succumbs to the action of the waves and water. But again, there is a little dam around it now. Uh, a little levee, we would say down here in New Orleans, a little levee that protects the structure from a total collapse. So we shall see what future generations uh, can observe on this site. This is all on the itinerary that one would have on these alumni trips. And I think that's probably uh, the end of my presentation. I wanted to be uh, give you something that you wouldn't ordinarily see but through the services of Tulane University, I've been fortunate to view these places, many different trips. The photographs that I've taken there are now a part of the collection at the National Gallery of Art in Washington in their image collections. So again, Tulane has been a wonderful um, platform of support for the work that I've done in Russia for a half century. Well, thank you, Professor Brumfield. That was really fascinating. Um, I'm not, I don't know if I can speak for everyone, but I'm ready to book my trip to Russia anytime that the, that opens back up for us. Um, we have a number of questions for you, and I just want to remind our viewers that if you have any additional questions, to please add them into the chat function, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, but we'll start. Um, somebody asked if each of the remarkable cupola spaces are actually decorative, or are they accessible to people? Uh in those wooden churches that we saw, particularly the first one, there is a drop ceiling, right? I might say, a low ceiling on the inside so that you cannot actually see up into the cupolas. They're there as a symbol of the presence of the community on the landscape. They're there for the aesthetic purpose. When you go into the churches, remember, we're really in a very cold climate here. So you've got to be careful about how you can heat these churches. Uh, whether they can be used for worship during the winter. So you wanted to have a lower ceiling. Uh, the area above, well, on the inside, 
It creates a microclimate that helps the church survive. That's important. But on the outside, it's the symbolism, that ascent to the heavens, uh, that power, the beauty of the wooden uh, craftsmanship, of what you can do with the natural element of wood. After all, these come from a uh, ecosphere that, that emphasizes wood. So that all of these things serve a symbolic purpose, but on the inside, you want to be a little bit protected uh, from the elements. So you would see a ceiling, a painted ceiling, by the way, uh, that uh, hovered uh, just a, a few meters above the main worship space. You wouldn't see all the way to the top of the Eucharist. I know you mentioned this earlier in your talk, but I think some people missed it. Can you talk a little bit about where the gold and silver color comes from on the onion-shaped domes, the, what yeah. kind of wood is used? Uh, on these wooden uh, cupolas, uh, they, they have a frame underneath of wood, uh, which if you looked at it, it, it was sort of like a uh, compressed bird cage. You know, it just has ribs with metal horizontal stays, right? And then you put these shingles on it and they're, they're uh, uh, start at the top and they're wedged in. You don't use nails because nails will tear the fabric of the wood and that will lead to early decay. So you push them in there and they're uh, slightly curved and they're cut of aspen, which is a soft, relatively soft wood, and it can be shaped. So there's just a slight curve to each one of those shingles. It's an amazing artistry. Uh, and they're wedged up there starting at the top and then they follow the contours of the onion, what we call the onion dome, um, until you have the entire um, uh, uh, element covered, sheathed. And then they will age, Aspen ages from gold to silver. So that you have over the decades, as the shingles age, they will change color, but it will still be a bright color in contrast to the dark pine logs uh, of the basic structure. Now, I have to add for that first photograph, you had a, a golden sheen that, that was purely a a, it, it's, it's one of those things that you cannot explain. Uh, you can work for decades and there'll be a moment like that uh, when you are simply blessed by the elements. There'd been a thunderstorm, uh, the structure was saturated with moisture, you have the setting summer sun in early August, with particularly rich yellowish orange light, and it hits that saturated surface of the log structure, repeat, log structure, and it creates that golden hue. Magic enchantment. Well, while we're on the topic of photography, someone asked if you feel that drone photography might impact your future documentation of these structures. Um, no, I'll leave that to uh, later generations. I'm uh, um, earthbound in my view of, uh, I'll climb up, as Perkutin Gorski did, I'll climb up on bell towers, sure, certainly. Uh, I'll take anything that nature or uh, the built uh, environment provides me to get a, a special perception. But uh, that's really the limit. I, I sh the images I take with a piece of equipment that I hold in my own hands. Somebody actually asked what kind of camera you're currently using. I use, uh, I've gone for Nikons, uh, so now I'm using uh, the Nikon. Uh, I've switched between D700, D800. Uh, back in the old days, had an F2. Uh, I just stayed with the Nikons. They have professional lenses that I like, the, uh, the shift perspective control lenses and so forth. But I also used a medium format Bronica camera, sort of like a Japanese Hasselblad. Uh, back in the 1980s and 1990s for greater uh, detail for publishing purposes. But those, that equipment practically took my arm off. Uh, fortunately, Russian friends would sometimes help me carry it around. Uh, but mobility is essential when you're in Russia, let me tell you. <laughs> um, Leanne Pfeiffer asks, have you seen the Prokutin Gorski collection in person? And if so, how did seeing those pieces affect and impact your work and passion? Yes, uh, very good. And I write about that at the beginning of the book. I was invited by the Library of Congress to create the first ever exhibit of Prudin Gorski's photographs. 
because when he made those color separations, he had a, um, a special projector. He showed them as uh, public showings. He didn't have the exhibits of them. He never printed them on paper. So that I took the Library of Congress collection at the library's invitation in 1985, began working on it. That exhibit um, opened in 1986. 80 color prints on chemical paper, ectochrome paper. I did that. But in preparation for this exhibit, I was thumbing through the, the great uh, contact. He made contact prints um, and there are 13 albums which have survived. Uh, and they're at the Library of Congress. And when I was leafing through those uh, albums of contact prints, enormous albums, and I saw again and again, I've been to these places. Um, uh, so that it was just a stroke of fortune that uh, my work and Prokutin Gorski's work followed a similar logic. And then after I became acquainted with the collection in 1985, uh, I began to think, I, didn't set out to reproduce his itineraries, but I always kept it in mind. And since that time, over the intervening, what is it, 35 years, um, I have now replicated, uh, intersected with almost all of his itineraries, including his work in the fabled cities of Samarkand and Bukhara in Central Asia where I was in May of 1972 as a graduate student on a trip arranged by Leningrad University. Didn't have any knowledge of Prokutin Gorski. Now explain that. That's fate, if nothing else. And I'm so pleased that the book actually has perhaps the longest chapter out of eight journeys that is devoted to that Central Asian um, architecture with the ceramic work and the mosques and the uh, madrasas, the religious schools, uh, all of that, uh, which is now in a very turbulent area, as we know. Uh, but uh, the Republic of Uzbekistan has restored them uh, so completely. I'm glad I was there in 72. I saw them more or less as Prokutin Gorsky saw them when he was there in 1911. Uh, so that gives you a a little bit of an idea of how my work intersects with Prokutin Gorsky. But I talk in more detail about it in the book. In fact, there's a chapter entitled The Intersecting Fates of Two Collections. Prokutin Gorsky at the Library of Congress, Rumfield at the National Gallery of Art. So speaking of things that we have seen, um, can you tell us about the interior of the drowned church of Krokino and is there an icon screen still present? No, no, that was all uh, uh, taken away very early in the Soviet period, everything that was in the church. Uh, you saw the, my photographs from 2006, my Tulane alumni crews from 2006. It was uh, rather early in the morning, depending on the ship schedule and which direction you're coming from, because these cruises run from Moscow to Petersburg and Petersburg to Moscow. Uh, so that you might see that church in midday or it might be early morning. I had to uh, jump up very quickly and <laughs> here it is. Uh, but uh, no, everything that was inside has long since disappeared. Uh, the fact that it was, that the church could have been demolished, uh, but they kept it there because the, um, the cupola at the top served as a light, a light beacon, not a lighthouse, but a beacon, navigation beacon. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, then the years of buffeting by waves, and water, and the changing temperatures, I just brought most of the walls down so that you, as you saw in my 2006 photograph, uh, you have only half of the church standing plus the bell tower. But still, it's important enough for Russian preservationists to build that dam around it, as they now have, so that the church can, at least in ruined form, still serve as a spiritual beacon. Not a literal beacon, but a spiritual beacon. And are all of these churches Russian Orthodox churches, or are yeah. they different denominations? They yeah. Are. Yes. I mean, there are um, uh, Catholic churches, uh, particularly usually in a, a sort of Gothic revival style, most of them built in the late 19th century. In fact, there's one uh, that I have in my book. It was built in Siberia by Polish exiles. Um, uh, and uh, there are uh, other denominations, usually much more modest in their structures, Lutheran, for example. But the, the, the main uh, uh, spiritual component uh, in Russian culture is the Russian Orthodox Church and the culture that they receive from Byzantium in the end of the 10th century. 
That's when yes. Byzantine Christianity came to the area we now call Russia. Well, I think we have two final questions. Um, one is, do you ever show your photography in Russia? All the time. I've had a number of exhibits there. And I have also, I should say, I have published 30 books in Russia, in Russia. They are usually bilingual editions, in English and in Russian. The Russians like what I do. They like the precision of what I do. They like the fact that it's documented. It is a scholarly as well as a uh, aesthetic approach. And you can see here uh, at the top on my lapel, this is the gold pen of the Russian Academy, Russian Academy of Arts. I was elected to that Russian Academy in 2006. Um, and under that, you have the Order of Friendship, which you mentioned, which granted last December uh, by the order of the president of the Russian Federation. So the Russians appreciate what I do. Uh, they have many photographers, they have collections, but my um, work has a unity to it. And it has a systematic approach uh, so that you combine the aesthetic and the documentary, uh, the notion of historical memory. Many of the structures that I photograph now exist only in my photographs. And while we certainly hope you will join us on another alumni travel trip, um, someone wants to know if you still lead study abroad summer trips for students. Uh, I used to, but the structures now that supported that, I took 10 groups with uh, uh, students and the community. I like that mix of community and students. Uh, during the 1990s, when there were still affordable hotels uh, and you could make it affordable on a student bu budget, uh, those structures, for various reasons, really uh, went away. I regret that. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, I uh, don't know the answer to that question, other than simply subsidies for student travel. Um, but uh, it they were enormously productive trips. I uh, at some sometimes the students would say, Professor Brumfield, we're probably going here just because you want to photograph it. But they still learn something. Uh, they learn quite a bit on those trips, and I am forever grateful. Uh, and I should express this gratitude right now, uh, the interaction, how much Tulane students uh, have done to enrich my work. What an excellent note to end on. Um, I want to let our viewers know that we a recording of the lecture with closed captionings will be emailed out tomorrow as well as posted on the alumni travel website. And I'm delighted to announce the winners of the books of Professor Brumfield's books, which are beautiful. Um, the winners are St. Clair McIntyre, Paul Fagenbaum, Rosalind Jacobs, Fred Hersel, and Colleen Moore. Congratulations to all of you. Those, um, we will be getting those out to you soon. Um, thank you for everybody for joining us tonight. Um, we hope you can join us on our next tra travel faculty lecture. And we encourage you to visit the Tulane Alumni Travel website um, for more information about our upcoming trips and hopefully all of us the ability to travel again soon. So thank you for joining us and good evening.